All right, amen. The first thing I want to say is I am sorry because of the fact that I know you're expecting Pastor Anderson. And so um, I wanted to hear Pastor Anderson, to be honest with you. But um, please pray for him. Obviously, he, he injured his back, and he, I know he's in a lot of pain. And um, I feel for him because last week, man, I was so sick last week. And it got to a point where I literally went on Facebook and I just asked everyone to just pray for me because I was so sick and my, my throat was in so much pain. And uh, I do believe in the power of prayer for sure. And so uh, I'm not just saying pray for Pastor Anderson, you know, because it's the Christian thing to do. It's pray for him because, you know, prayer works. And so I uh, pray that uh, his back is able to heal and uh, that he would be able to make it to my church tomorrow. But, you know, it's probably not going to happen, you know. He was supposed to preach at my church tomorrow, but it's probably not going to happen. And that's all right. I'm sure he's going to preach at both of our churches sometime in the near future, Pastor Anderson. That one's for you. And so, uh, but I'm thankful to be here. And uh, I'm thankful for Pastor Pazarnsky and Holdfast Baptist Church. And um, we need more churches like Holdfast Baptist Church because of the fact that it's in California. And we need more churches in California. And I really believe that this church here is doing a great work here by winning souls to Christ and uh, preaching God's word, raising godly families and serving the Lord. And I think it's making a great impact in the city. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about a, a parable in Matthew chapter 13 that has a little bit to do with that. Look down at your Bibles at verse 44. It says here, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth it, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. And the title of my sermon this evening is Buy the Field. Buy the Field. Purchase the Field. I'm going to explain what this parable is referring to here in just a bit, and then we're going to give some application to this particular story. It's actually one of my favorite parables because of the fact that when you read some of these parables, what Jesus is doing here is that he's giving some carnal temporal illustrations and examples in order to help us to really understand and grasp the importance of making an eternal investment. And that's really what I want to do tonight. I want to explain this parable, and Lord willing, at the end of this sermon, you'll have a greater uh, respect or value for the eternal rather than the temporal. And really, if you think about it, you know, a lot of Christians, the reason it's hard for Christians to serve God, the reason it's hard for Christians to win souls, to just be a good Christian, to serve the Lord, is because of the fact that they're too temporal-minded. But if they just realize how, much, how many rewards are set before us when we sacrifice, really when we invest our lives into the eternal, you know, we would realize that obedience to God will not only benefit the kingdom of God, but it actually benefits us in the temporal and in the long run as well. So my goal tonight is to help you to be a little less temporal minded and more eternally minded. And so here in Matthew chapter 13, read this great story and it's only one verse, but there's so much packed into this one verse. Basically what's happening here, of course, Jesus Christ is trying to help people to grasp what the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And he explains that the kingdom of heaven is as if there is a treasure in a particular field. And I'm going to extrapolate some things here that's not necessarily stated, but, you know, we can, we can theorize that this is what's taking place. A man is walking by this field, apparently, and he probably sees a little some, something shining out of the ground, maybe a pearl, silver, gold, some sort of treasure kind of catches his attention. He goes to it. He finds this hidden treasure in this particular field. And obviously, this treasure is of great price. It's of great value. It's worth a lot of money, okay? It's, worth, it's very valuable. And how do we know that? Well, when he finds this treasure, he's like finder's keepers, you know? He really wants to keep this treasure. But the, but the problem is, is that the field doesn't belong to him, okay? The real estate doesn't belong to him. And he's thinking to himself, I can't just take this treasure because obviously the field belongs to someone else. Therefore, what he does, the logical thing that he does is that he takes all of his possessions, everything that he owns. He goes and he sells everything that he has. OK. And, you know, you can think about maybe his home, his possessions, all the money that he saved, all the valuable things that we would esteem as being something that's important this side of eternity, he just takes it all and he just uses it to buy that real estate. Goes to the guy and he says, I'll purchase this field and I'll purchase it with all this money. And you think of the guy who probably owns the field. He's probably thinking it's not for sale, but man, this is a lot of money. You're willing to pay for this. 
take it, right? And so you think of the man who owns the field. In his mind, he's probably thinking, this guy's making a bad deal. It's a bad investment. He's purchasing this field here, and he's paying for it way more than it actually costs. But in the mind of the man who found the treasure, he knows this is not a sacrifice. This is an investment. Knowing full well that if he purchases the field, he's going to gain the treasure and ultimately have more in the long term than he does sacrificing in the short term. It's a wonderful story here. And what this parable is trying to get across here is the fact that the kingdom of heaven, the eternal, whether that is the rewards that we receive from Christ, the honor and the glory that we'll get from Jesus in the millennial reign, and the new heaven and the new earth, all the things that we will possess one day in the eternal, it's worth not our sacrifice, it's worth our investment Amen. this side of eternity. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a crazy amount of money in the bank or you have to be a rich person to invest. You just have to invest whatever you have temporally in this life to gain that much the more in the eternal. Buy the field is what the Bible's telling us here. And what he's trying to get across here is this. You know, don't be so caught up in the temporal and the finances of this world, the riches of this world, the fame of this world, the possessions and the house and the vehicles of this world that you're not willing to invest some of those things into the eternal so you can get the treasure, the hidden treasure that's found in this world. Okay? This is what the parable is referring to, investing all that you have for the long-term reward. Now, what's one of the reasons why people don't do this? Because the, the parable is pretty self-explanatory. Jesus is saying, hey, don't value money. Don't value possessions. Obviously, these are things that we need. These are things that we need to live and to feed our families and to live in a house and to do all those things. But don't exalt them to a position where that's all you think about. That's what your focus is. And you're no longer investing in the eternal. And what he's trying to get across here is the fact that we need to be more eternally minded, set our affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. Now, let me just say this. is What this is not teaching is that you just go broke for Christ, right? You just sell everything you have because, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow or something. There's a lot of people that have done that, you know. I remember back in 2013, someone by the name of Harold Camping had said that Jesus Christ was going to come back, I think it was like March 23rd, 2013. And so there's a bunch of people that are selling their yachts, their houses, all their possessions. He had all these billboards all over Los Angeles. I don't know if there's any billboards here at that time, but in Los Angeles, a ton of billboards that he was coming back on this day. And I'm just thinking to myself, this guy's making us look so bad, right? He's saying, Jesus is coming back on March 23rd. And of course, March 23rd came, March 24th came, and nothing happened. But you know what did happen to those people who invested? They didn't invest, they didn't sacrifice. They just spent their possessions foolishly into a false prophet and a false prophecy of Jesus Christ. And they paid the consequences for that. That's not what Jesus Christ is asking of us, okay? Because obviously, if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel, right? God wants us to give what we can give and invest what we can invest, whether that's our resources, our time, our talents for the eternal. So we see here, he takes this treasure, he hides it in the field, he goes back home, he sells all that he has to buy that field. And of course, it doesn't specifically say what happens, but we know what happens. He buys the field, as soon as he buys it, you know, the papers are given over. He goes, he could care less about the rest of the field. He could probably buy a bunch of fields with, that, with the treasure that he finds. He goes and he digs up the treasure and he cashes in the check, right? Now, what's one of the reasons why people don't really, really, uh, or don't really understand this particular principle that we see here in the Bible? Well, if I, if I were to guess as to why, based upon this parable, I would say because they haven't found treasure. Because what motivated this guy to sell all that he had, the fact that he found treasure. And a lot of the times, it's not that treasure for the Christians doesn't exist, it's because they're not looking for it. Or they're looking for treasure in all the wrong places, right? They're looking for fame and fortune and the temporal wealth of this world, rather than looking for the, the hidden treasures of God and the eternal. You see, if you really spend time meditating and thinking upon how valuable the rewards are, the recompense of Jesus Christ in the eternal, Investing in the eternal would make a lot of sense, right? So a lot of Christians don't do this because of the fact they haven't found treasure. They're not looking in the Word of God for treasure. 
They're not looking for souls and treasure. They're not looking into the eternal for that which is valuable and uh, will bless them in the long term. Let me say this, is that anything worth having requires a substantial amount of trade-offs, right? Anything worth having requires a substantial amount of trade-offs. And you know, obviously there's good trade-offs and there's bad trade-offs. And in order for us to be successful in the Christian life, we need to make calculated decisions to be successful this side of eternity for eternity. In other words, invest in the spiritual, invest in the eternal, invest in the things of God, the service of God, in order to receive that great recompense one day. Now go with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I'm going to go over a couple points tonight regarding this particular subject. Now, number one, let me say this is that this doesn't apply to you or me. But when you think about it, you know, the, the world, the unsaved, even they have to pay a price to a certain extent, right? Now, obviously, we know that salvation has been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And anyone who believes on Jesus Christ will receive salvation. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, right? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works that any man should boast. So over and over again, the Bible emphasizes the fact that salvation is not something you have to pay for. It's already been paid for by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is believe on Jesus Christ, receive that free gift, and it's ours forever. But let me say this is that the world does have to pay the price to find salvation, though. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, the, the Bible teaches us that every individual in this world has to respond to the light that God gives them, right? And even then, obviously, they can't be saved. But what the Bible's teaching us here is the fact that when a person is unsaved, you know, they're given a measure of light in their heart, referring to the laws of God written in their hearts that God wants them to respond to in order to situate them into a position where a soul winner is sent to them, give them the gospel, and they could get saved. Now, you're in Acts chapter 10. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth, listen to this, cometh to the light." that as these may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, every single one of you in here, someone gave you the gospel, you heard the gospel online, someone got you saved, but you know, at the end of the day, you situated yourself by responding to the light that God gave you, which is why God gave you more light, which is why God sent the soul winner or allowed you to hear a gospel presentation and gave you understanding of that message. You pay the price to look for the truth, in other words, okay? And this is why, you know, when people bring up the subject of, so are you trying to tell me that, you know, the African guy in the Congo and the jungles, if they've never heard the name of Christ, they're going to die and go to hell? Yes. If they don't believe anybody, there's no exception to that rule. If a person dies without Christ, they're going to hell. There's no exception to that rule. You're like, well, how is that fair? I'll tell you how it's fair. The Bible tells us that the laws of God are written in a person's heart. And even the African dude and the jungles of the Congo, where there's all types of uh, witchcraft and paganism, if that person seeks the Lord, seeks the God of the Bible, which every human being has the capacity to do so, seeks the God of the Bible, God will make himself found. You say, are you trying to tell me that God will just like send like a missionary to him just to win that person to Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. God would send one missionary for one person if that one person is responding to the light that God gives them. So there's no exception to that rule. It's like, well, what if they just believe in God? Don't they, go to, don't they go to heaven? No, they have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if this person is paying the price by seeking after God 
and looking for the Lord and trying to get understanding of the God of the universe, God will recompense that person by sending someone with the truth and the message so they can be saved. So every person that has died and gone to hell, yeah, obviously there's certain individuals that have had a clearer presentation of the gospel than others, but at the end of the day, every person who has gone to hell has gone there by their own choice, my friends, because they have rejected the measure of light that was given to them at some point or another in their life. Now, let me give you an example of this. Look at Acts chapter 10 and verse number 30. Talking about Cornelius here. Cornelius was not a safe person, but he, he was a God-fearing man. The Bible specifically says that he was a God-fearing man. And, you know, he would do all these works to have acceptance with God. But, you know, what? he wasn't saved because doing works doesn't save you. But obviously he's doing this with the intention of wanting to please God or get God's attention. And, of course, the result of that is that Peter came to him to give him the gospel and he eventually got saved. Look at verse 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. So he's fasting, he's doing these alms, he's feeding the poor, and he's doing it because he's a God-fearing man. And so God sends an angel to tell him and confirm that he's hearing this, he's seeing this, right? Verse 32, send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, the reason Peter is saying this is because uh, Peter's a little bit, he's being a little bit of a racist here, okay? <laughs> you know, he's not necessarily reaching the Gentiles because he only wants to reach Jews. And so he had to have this vision from God where these unclean animals came down in a sheet and, he, and God told them, rise, kill, and eat. And he's like, no unclean animal has ever entered into my mouth. And he had to do it three times in order to convey the message to Peter. What God has uh, consecrated, call not that holy. In other words, like, I've commissioned you to go preach the gospel to these Gentiles. And so go get the so-called unclean animal and give them the gospel. And obviously, the unclean animal in the story is Cornelius, because Cornelius is not a Jew. He is essentially a Gentile, okay? And that's why he says, God is no respecter of persons. Well, of course not, Peter. You're a respecter of persons, okay? God has never been a respecter of persons. You're the one who has refused. But of course, Peter now is obeying. And he says in verse 35, the key, key verse here, But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is saved? No is accepted with him. What does that mean? You know, a person who's in the Congo, a person who's in the Amazon, a person who is in an area where there's no Bible-believing church, if they fear God and they seek to work righteousness because they're responding to the light that God gives them, God accepts that and will send a soul winner to go preach the gospel to them, to get them saved, because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's right. And he's willing to sacrifice resources and people and churches to get the gospel message to that person if they're responding to the light that God gives them. And so what we see here is that even the unsaved have to pay a price to find salvation, right? They have to respond to the light that God gives them and seek the truth out and come to the light that their deeds might be reproved, right? That they're wrought in God. The Bible tells us you don't have to turn there. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11, let us therefore labor, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Of course, conveying that same principle that the unsaved have to labor to find the truth, okay, and seek the truth. Now, that in and of itself cannot get them saved. And I think a great example of this, aside from Cornelius, is the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch came to Jerusalem, and he even got himself a copy of the book of Isaiah. He came there, he bought that copy, and he's even trying to read the Bible, and he's trying to, he's trying to understand what's going on there. But obviously that's not going to get him saved, because reading the Bible for the unsaved person can't get a person saved. Okay? That person requires a regenerated believer to explain the gospel unto them, as noted by Acts chapter 8, where Philip enjoins himself to the chariot, explains the gospel, and the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved. But what we see is the Ethiopian eunuch was willing to go to Jerusalem, 
was willing to pay the price to look for the truth, even pay the price to purchase the Word of God, the book of Isaiah. I mean, the, the man traveled far and wide to find the truth, right? And how did God respond to that? He sent them uh, Philip the Evangelist, even to the point where he, it's almost like he miraculously just transported him there in the presence of the Ethiopian eunuch so he can preach the gospel to him and get him saved. You know, I also think of, for example, uh, the, the, the Queen of Sheba, who the Bible talks about. She came from, from far and wide to hear the wisdom of Solomon and how she was willing to pay the price with a great train of spices and all these gifts for Solomon. And Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. Right? Now, thankfully, you know, even when people respond to the light that God gives them, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Even the word of faith, the Bible says. You know, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to find Jesus. In fact, you, you will not find Jesus in Jerusalem, right? You know, where will you find them? You know, when someone opens their mouth boldly and makes known the mysteries of the gospel. Okay? Now, turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, if you would. So let's talk about Christians now. We're talking about buying the field. And now let's, let's apply this to believers. Pay the price. Buy the field to live by dying to self. Pay the price to live by dying to self. Buy the field of living a Christian life. Now, obviously, if living the Christian life was easy, everyone would be doing it. And when we talk about the Christian life, we're talking about all the basic principles and, and disciplines that are attached to the Christian life. We're talking about church attendance. We're talking about Bible reading. We're talking about soul winning. We're talking about holy living. We're talking about living a life that's pleasing unto the Lord, fulfilling your God-given role in this life. You know, that's a lot of stuff to do. But you know what the Bible tells us? Buy that field. You're like, that's such a big field. There's so much to have to pay and... You know, it's all grown over with thorns and thistles. And it's like, I don't know if I'm willing to invest that much to purchase this barren field. I mean, it just doesn't look as nice as the well-watered plains of, of, of Sodom. It just doesn't look as nice as the well-watered plains of Egypt. It just doesn't look as nice as the world looks unto me. You know, I don't know if it's worth buying that field. Well, what if I told you that there's a million dollars in that field? What if I told you there were treasures beyond measure found in the field of living the Christian life? You'd purchase that, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you knew the eternal recompense that you receive is far greater than the so-called sacrifice that you would make to live the Christian life, you'd purchase that field. And the goal for us as Christians is to look beyond the field, look beyond the thistles, look beyond the bushes, look beyond the deadness and the bareness of that field, and look for that treasure. And recognize purchasing this ugly field of living the Christian life, being in submission to my husband, serve, loving my wife as Christ loved the church, winning souls, spending all day Sunday here at church, reading the word of God every single day, cleaning up my life out of, from all the sin that I've accumulated in this world. You know, if you understand that purchasing that field will give you a great treasure, oh, you'd make that investment. Right. Living the Christian life would no longer be a sacrifice. You'd recognize this is an investment because he's able to give abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You see, this is Christianity. It's not Buddhism. Buddhism, you live like a good life and then you become a butterfly in the, in the next life or something. <laughs> Obviously, we don't believe that, but that's what they believe. You know, you live a decent life or whatever, and you, you get to become like a caterpillar or something. It's like they motivate people by saying, hey, you get to be a roach. <laughs> that sucks. So you live all this, you just live this life of sacrifice, of being like a vegan and just being, you know, vegetarian and not even enjoying rich, the things that God has given us richly to enjoy. And then you die and then you go to hell. Now, according to their theology, it's, you know, reincarnation, right? You just become whatever, you know, an animal or something, a tiger, a dog or something, you know? Or in India where you just become a cow. What a great life. What a great investment to just live a moral life, a life of sacrifice, just so I can become a cow in my next life and no one eats me because everyone's a vegan in India. 
It's a total loss. And obviously that doesn't happen. And it, it, you know, if you don't believe that, just ask all the billions of Buddhists who are in hell today and Hindus who are in hell today who thought that and now they realize, you know, um, I'm not a cow. I'm, they would actually prefer to be a cow than what they're actually getting now. Pay the price to live for Christ. Purchase that field. And you know, a lot of Christians I've noticed is that they look at the field of the Christian life and everything it has to offer and they're just not satisfied with it because it lacks the luster of this world. It lacks the prestige and all the glitz and the glamour. It lacks all the temporal gratifications that they're looking for, but they're, they're looking for it in the wrong places, my friends. The field is there. Purchase the field because there's treasures in that field. Look at Luke 9, 21. It says, He straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders, and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, obviously, they knew what that meant. When he says, take up your cross, because he hadn't gone to the cross yet, but they're obviously living under Roman rule where criminals are put to death via the crucifix, right? So when he's telling them, deny yourself, take up your cross, he's basically telling them, you need to die. And you know what the greatest way to help you, the greatest way to help me to really view how valuable that field is, is you just got to die sometimes. And I don't mean physically, don't go out there and do something bad to yourself. I'm saying die to self. Like, yeah, but I want the possessions of this world and die to that desire. I just want the fame and fortune and all the cars and the glitz and the glamour of this world. Then why don't you die to self and not desire those things? He says there, for whosoever shall save his life, verse 24, shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it. You know, if you really want to live, you've got to die. But if you choose to live this side of eternity for self, then essentially you're going to become a castaway. Because it goes on to say in verse 25, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? Now that applies to both believers and unbelievers. You know, you look at the rich men of this world, right? Who have gained the whole world but then they lose themselves. They're not even saved. They go to hell. You think about those billionaires who went into that submarine a month ago or whatever it was. Billions of dollars going just to go into a submarine and literally go down to the depths of hell in a split second. You know, I'm sure every single one of those people who were in that submarine who died, they would, they would invest any amount of money from their bank accounts to just live one day outside of hell. But you know, this also applies to Christians because it says, or oh, be a castaway. Because, you know, obviously Christians can't lose their salvation. They can't lose the eternal gift that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But they can become a castaway. That's why the Apostle Paul said that I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Unless by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. See, the goal of a Christian is not to just, obviously we want, we want to get saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But even thereafter, we want to stay the course and not be a castaway, keep serving God, not backslide, not go back to the world, and keep an eternal perspective on life. Amen. Not allow the temporal affections of this world to choke the word where you become unfruitful. Because of the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and you become unfruitful. You know, thank God for salvation, but folks, let's move beyond that. Let us go on into perfection, the Bible says. And live a life of eternal significance so that we don't become castaways. Purchase the field of living the Christian life. Don't allow the deadness or the barrenness of that field to cause you to think it's not worth the investment to live the Christian life. Like, oh, man, but, you know, all my friends are having all this fun, and my friend has a buddy, and, you know, or my, my friend has a girlfriend, and they're fornicating, and he seems to be having so much fun out in the world, and nothing bad is happening to him. Yeah, but his time will come, my friends. 
You know, the, the, the field of virginity may seem a little barren, but I guarantee you there's treasures in there, amen? There's a godly marriage found in there. There's godly children found in there. There's, there's so much found in that field. Don't allow the world to skew your perception of that field of marriage, of that field of being a virgin, amen? The Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Yeah, you know what? Purchasing that field of living a godly life, it's going to cost you something for sure. You know, it's going to require you cleaning up your life. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The Bible says, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed into sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you should obey it and the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What is he saying? Buy that field. It's worth it. That way sin doesn't have dominion over your life. Clean up your life. Oh, man, but that field, it's going to require for me to stop smoking cigarettes. It's going to require me to stop drinking and stop fornicating and stop coveting. And it's, it requires a lot of cleanup. Yeah, that field requires a lot of cleanup. But let me say this. There's a treasure in that field. And if you could just find that treasure and see the value of that treasure in that field of living a holy life, you know what your attitude's going to be? Oh, this is worth the payment. This is worth the investment. This is worth cleaning up my life. This is worth repenting of my sin to please the Lord. This is worth living a holy life that's pleasing unto God because of this treasure that I will receive when the payment is made. Buy that field. Why not? Buy the field. We are told that Moses chose to suffer the afflictions with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That he esteemed the reproach of Christ's greater riches. And that's what we need to do. We need to esteem the reproach of the greater riches that are found in that field and stop looking at the barrenness and how ugly that field is. Folks, we're not necessarily doing this just for the field. We're doing it because we know there's a treasure that's within that field once we pay the price. Okay? Go with me if you would to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, if you would. Luke chapter 14. Now, with that being said... If you find that field, and you know the treasure in that field, and you start making that investment, don't be double-minded. Do not be a double-minded Christian. What is that? A person who just tossed to and fro. You're in church at one time, then you're not in church the other. Like, I'm going I'm to go for God at one time, and then you're just back in the world the next week. You tell Pastor Brzezarnski, I'm going to be here Sunday night, you know, Wednesday night, I'm going to be faithful, and then you're not. You know, it's, if you're going to buy the field, just buy it. Look what the Bible says in Luke 14, verse 27. It says, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So apparently, in order for you to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to take up your cross. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and listen to this, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? He's like, the logical thing to do is that when you are intending to, to build something, you need to make sure you make a line item and see that you even have enough to finish. It says, less happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. Do you know why your family doesn't take you serious sometimes in the Christian life? Because you're so in and out of the Christian life. Sometimes what, what the family of believers need is consistency, not you preaching to them. Not you condemning them and being a bad testimony to them and just ripping their face and getting on your mom and getting on your dad and getting on your brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes they actually need, believe it or not, I hate to say this, but it's just like lifestyle evangelism sometimes in your household to be a good testimony. Why? Because of the fact that a bad testimony is when you're in and out of church and in and out of the will of God. And what happens? You're basically showing that you're not able to build. And you know what people do? They begin to mock. You know how a lot of people say, oh, this is just a phase they're going through. This is just a phase he's going through. He's all about Jesus right now. It's just a phase. 
But you know, and by the way, people, I remember family, my family used to say that to me when I first got saved. And, you know, uh, it obviously wasn't a phase, you know. Here I am today preaching God's word. But that's not to say there wasn't instances when I didn't want to quit, because obviously I didn't want to quit. But I always thought about this passage. It's like, I don't want my family to mock me or Christianity or the Lord Jesus Christ because I'm not able to finish. And obviously, I'm not done yet. I still have more decades until either the Lord returns or I go home to be with the Lord. But the point that the passage is making here is that when you purchase that field, follow through. Follow through with purchasing the field. Don't get, there's no refunds. <laughs> It's like you purchase the field, like, I changed my mind. I need my money back or something like that. It says there, saying, verse 30, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. I'm going to skip the other verses here. Go with me, if you would, to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Hey, buy the field. The message this evening is buy the field. It's not a sacrifice. It's an investment to live the Christian life. Let me say this is that buy the field Regarding, uh, regarding the, the field that is white already, that's all white already into harvest, the soul winning field. Purchase the field of preaching the gospel, especially in Fresno, because you guys go soul winning in this heat. God bless you guys. In Southern California, we, you know, we, I don't think we'll even hit 100. We might. And if we hit 100, we'll go soul winning, whining a little bit. But you guys do this on a, on a weekly basis. And I can see, you know, it may be hard for some people. It's just like, I don't know if it's worth going out in the heat, you know, to just go preach the gospel and get rejected or get people who just don't want to listen. Hey, I'm telling you, there's a valuable treasure in that field referring to that field of lost souls that need the gospel. There's one person out there that wants to listen. There's one person out there that wants the gospel in that field. Yeah, when you go and purchase that field, you buy that field, you go soul winning on that Saturday, you go to that soul winning marathon, there's going to be that one person. And you know what the Bible describes converts as? The crowns of rejoicing, my friends. Look at 1 Thessalonians 2. I, did I have your turn to Mark 10? Okay, go to 1 Thessalonians 2 instead. I'm trying to see if you guys know your way around the Bible. I'm just kidding. Go to 1 Thessalonians 2. I'll read to you from Mark 10, 28. It says, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and follow thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, key word there, and in the world to come, eternal life. What is he saying? Hey, if you purchase that field of lost souls, not only are you going to be recompensed in the eternal, you'll even get a recompense this side of eternity. You know, that tells me God's a great boss. He's not a cheapskate, amen? He pays his servants and his employees well, not only in the eternal, but even in this life. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 says, Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. I truly believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, part of the reward that we receive from Jesus Christ, aside from the actual distribution of authority that we get in the millennial reign, is believers that we get to essentially either rule over or rule with. This is what's referred to as the crowns of rejoicing. And if there's a field of, 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 of lost souls, and if we told you there's 10 crowns waiting for you at this field that you will see in the resurrection, why not work that field? Purchase that field. Put in the work. Purchase and buy that field. Why? To find those 10 crowns. Even if there's one crown, amen, it's still worth it. Now, obviously, we don't know whatever neighborhood we go to. We don't know how many crowns are awaiting us. But we go and we sow in hope, in faith, knowing that the gospel has power, knowing that the word of God has power and it doesn't return back void. And we go looking for that treasure. We go looking for that crown of rejoicing, that lost soul who will come to Christ and we will know for all of eternity. 
Buy that field. Buy that field. Look at the time here. Go to Acts chapter 20, if you would. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. The sermon tonight is by the field. I'm trying to exhort you and encourage you to no longer view your service for God as a sacrifice, but rather as an investment. So when you wake up in the morning on Sunday morning and it, you just get that feeling like, I don't want to go to church, just realize, go not because you're sacrificing your time, but because you're investing your time. Amen. When you don't feel like going soul winning, just view it as a field that has a crown that you're not sacrificing, you're actually investing in. Let me breeze over this point, but you, you know, buy the field of learning the Bible. Pay the price to learn the Word of God. What do I mean by that? You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 23, verse 23, you don't have to turn there. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. You know, it, you can either do one of two things when it comes to learning the Bible. You could either read the Word of God for yourself and learn it through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, or you can learn it from some con artist out there through some devotional, through some commentary with cubic zirconius, some fake gold out there that rubs off as soon as you put it on your neck. You're like, oh man, this is such a great truth, and then you put on that necklace, and then it's, you know, you're in this weather, and then your, your, your neck starts turning green because the, the gold is wearing off because it's fake. It's better to just pay the price to read the Word of God yourself. Now, it costs a lot more. Learning the Word of God for yourself costs way more. But that's because it's, 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 it, the treasure is valuable. To study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible tells us over and over again that the word of God is likened unto rubies and jewels and gold and silver. And we as God's people are to just dig and dig into that field of the Bible and just keep digging. And you're like, oh man, but this field is so dry. I'm reading through like numbers and it's, or I'm reading the first and second chronicles. It just seems so dry. Just reading all these names and all these stories. I don't get it. Yeah, but here's the thing though. The longer you dig, the longer you dig, the more likely it is you will find treasures. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the most satisfying things for me as a Christian is when you find those nuggets of gold in the Word of God. When you're under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you read the Word of God and you're like, I just learned this right now. This is amazing. And you're just like, I've been digging. I mean, folks, I've been saved. I just, I, I, July 22nd uh, was when I basically, I got saved. July 22nd, 2007. So I've been saved for 16 years. And I've been reading the Word of God since then over and over and over again. And you know what I find when I read God's Word over the last 16 years? There's still more treasures to find. Even 16 years later, as I'm reading Genesis to Revelation, as I'm reading through the historical books, as I'm reading through the Psalms, through the poetical books, through the major and minor prophets, through the Gospels, I'm still finding more treasure even to this day because there's enough treasure to go around, my friends. But you know what? I've been in churches where they rather just go to the commentary, go to the devotional books, Go to the unsaved of this world, the natural man that receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, to learn the Word of God, because they're not willing to put into the work themselves to buy that field. Buy the field. Buy the field. I'm almost done. Buy the field. Let me say this. Buy the field of just getting into church. This church right here is a valuable field. Amen. It's a very valuable field. And, you know, it breaks my heart when people don't value church. You know, thank God for the Internet. We thank God for YouTube, although I don't really thank God for it anymore because I can't seem to keep a channel. Just, they're just constantly being deleted over and over again. And, um, you know... I hate YouTube sometimes. I'll just be honest with you. You put all this work into YouTube. I'm like trying to purchase that field. And then it's just like, you know, the Jews take it over and then they, they, they rob me of my field, <laughs> basically. 
You know, but thank God for social media. Thank God for social media, YouTube, or, you know, um, uh, Rumble and all these social media platforms. I thank God for them because of the fact that we've had a lot of people come to our church because of that. A lot of people saved because of that. We've had visitors in our church because of that who found us through social media. People who have gone to our friends' churches because of our social media platform. So thank God for that. But let me say this, is that nothing will ever replace being in church. Amen. Nothing will ever replace being in church. I mean, thank God for the preaching of God's word in the Internet. But, folks, that's only one aspect and one factor of being in the local New Testament church. Nothing beats being in a local New Testament church in that field. There's so much treasure in that. Amen. Preaching is obviously one of the greatest treasures in church. But you know what? Fellowship is a great treasure to be had. Right. You know what? Singing the hymns with God's people is a great treasure to be had. Going so on and getting trained and having that fellowship, exhorting one another daily is a great treasure to be had. And you know how many Christians are out there on internet land not willing to pay that price? Oh, it's too far. It's like 30 minutes away or something. Oh, but the church is so far. It's like an hour away. Oh, man, but it's an hour and a half away. What if I told you that there is a treasure chest filled with $1 billion worth of treasure an hour and a half away? Oh, you'll be there in a second. She'll be like, let me scrounge up as much cash to get into this car and head right off. What if I told you that there's a treasure chest filled with millions of dollars that you can find and it's there every single week, every Sunday? And then when you find that treasure Sunday morning, you know, the, 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 the man, the man of God says, hey, if you come back tonight, there's more treasure. And then you come back Sunday night and you're like, by the way, there's some rubies and pearls of great price on Wednesday night. Oh, you'd be there every service. You would invest all types of gas. You would get yourself an electric car. You would bike there if you had to. You get a skateboard. You get a moped. You would get yourself to church just like that. Why? Because now you know it's worth it. One of the greatest challenges for a pastor, let me say this. One of the greatest challenges, I'm sure, for Pastor Bozarnski is helping to communicate the value of being in church. Helping our people to realize it's not a sacrifice you coming here and sitting here while I scream at you for one hour. It's actually an investment. It's not a sacrifice for you to be here and listen to God's word. It's an investment. You're accumulating treasure when you come here. I'm trying to shift your mind and your perspective on church attendance. Look at the Bible says in Acts 20, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, verse 28, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood, the Bible says. Luckily, this, this, this treasure is free, amen? All you have to do is just come and get it. Get in your vehicle and come and get it. Come here Sunday morning, you're already here, so stay for Sunday night. You already made the drive to come all the way here on Sunday morning. Just why don't you just stay a couple more hours and accumulate more treasure? You're like, well, it's not that easy, though. You know, we have to, what do we got to do? <laughs> you know, we have a barbecue to go to, or we have a birthday party, we have... I have to do something that I can't really think of what it is right now, but it's something really important. Is it more important than gaining eternal treasures? Because I can guarantee you it's probably not. And what I've learned is the more church you have, the better Christian you'll be, and the better life gets. The more eternally minded you become, the more you're in church. Go to Revelation chapter 3 if you would. Revelation chapter 3. Hey, buy the field of having a good marriage. Amen. Buy the field of raising godly children. And of course, pay the price necessary to truly fellowship with the Lord. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, a lot of Christians out there, they want to live the Christian life, but there's one aspect of the Christian life they, they just don't really like. You know what that is? Suffering. And they don't really view the, they don't see the value in suffering for the name of Christ sometimes. Whether it be through persecution, whether it be through just trials and tribulations that happen to us, the difficulties of this world. 
And they don't realize that suffering in such a manner yields great treasures in this life and in the life to come. Look at Revelation 3 and verse 14. It says, Unto the angel of the church of the lay of the Seans, Revelation 3, 14, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What's the solution? Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Why? That thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes self that thou mayest see. He's basically saying, you know, you're so lukewarm. You feel like you're increased with goods, that you're rich, you don't need anything. You haven't really gone through anything hard. You don't really realize the value in suffering. And no one likes to suffer, my friends. We don't like suffering. We don't like pain. We don't like going through difficult times. But it's so necessary in the Christian life. And God says there, in order for you to get out of this, this lukewarm mentality that you're in, this lukewarm condition, spirit condition that you're in, buy of me gold, try it in the fire. Go through some fire in your life. Suffer persecution for righteousness sake. Don't quit when you're going through a hard time. When you're going through health problems, your family's against you, you're going through a, a difficult time, don't clock out of the Christian life. Stick with it. Purchase that gold. Try it in the fire. And he says there in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous therefore and repent. Listen to this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is referring to fellowship. He's saying, I go to every church and I knock on that door to see if the congregation of that church is willing to suffer for the name of Christ, is willing to go through trials and difficulties and fire and tribulation. Why? Well, like as the Apostle Paul said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. What's the message tonight? By the field. By the field. I'm going to finish with this illustration here. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Mel Fisher. And Mel Fisher was actually a treasure hunter. And there is a, a, a ship, a Spanish ship, called Nuestra Señora de Antocha. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And this is a ship a vessel of a fleet of ships that sank in a hurricane in 1622. So it sank and it was on its way to Spain, but it was filled with just an insurmountable amount of just treasures and gold, a lot of money, okay? And it, 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 it ran into a hurricane, most of the people on that ship died, and the treasure sank to the bottom of the ocean. Well, this man by the name of Mel Fisher, he was born in like 1920s, I believe it was, found out about this treasure. And this is a man who had a business in California, a scuba diving business, teaching people how to go uh, scuba diving. And he was very wealthy, very successful businessman, had a very lucrative business with that. And he heard about this, and he was so inspired by the potential findings of this treasure that he actually ended up selling his business. He sold his business that he invested so much into. He sold his business, sold his house, and he moved his family to Florida and eventually to this area, uh, uh, the Keys, in order to invest his life into looking for this particular treasure. Now, when he, he researched it, he looked at all the historical facts, and he basically thought to himself, well, I basically have a good understanding of where this treasure is. And he thought to himself, it'll take about six weeks to find this treasure. Well, six weeks turn into 16 years. 16 years of investing hundreds of thousands of dollars, getting a ship, accumulating all these employees to go and look for this treasure of this vessel that had sank in a hurricane in 1622. And let me say this, this cost him a lot. It actually cost him three members of his, of his, uh, uh, of his, uh, of his ship, including his eldest son. 
who died uh, scuba diving looking for this treasure. Sold his business, moved his family, invested hundreds of thousands of dollars, lost close friends and family, his own son, seeking for this treasure. And then finally, in 1985, he found it. He found what they called the Great Pile that was worth four to $500 million. And he ended up becoming very famous and popular. And even if you look it up, it's a pretty amazing story from, from just a, a carnal perspective because of the fact that the government, once they found out that he had gotten this treasure, they're just like, oh, we, we, that's actually ours. <laughs> you know, you, this is theft, okay, so we need to take all of it. And, and you know, because, you know, the, the government, they're just, that's what they do. And they're like, oh, you found it? Well, that's actually ours. You're stealing that from us, even though they didn't do anything to look for the treasure. It's like, it's in our borders, so it's ours. And then he went to court with it, and it finally ended up going to the Supreme Court, and he actually ended up winning. And so not only was all the treasure, the four to five hundred million dollars worth of treasure, which it was it was estimated to be four to five hundred million dollars back then. It's way more now, obviously. I mean, uh, tens of thousands of gold coins. But not only was the treasure his, but so was the ship. So he ended up owning all of those things. And, you know, he had museums and everything. He became a very successful man. Of course, he passed away. He was not saved. But, I, I, you know, I thought to myself, this is a great picture of what we as Christians should do. This man was willing to sell everything, was willing to lose lives, even the life of his son, was willing to invest not only resources and time, but even 16 years worth of not finding anything. And every day he would say this, today's the day, today's the day. Folks, if Mel Fisher, who's obviously burning in hell today, because he did not take any of that treasure with him, is willing to invest that much time, energy, manpower, resources, for a corruptible crown, how much should we be willing to invest to buy the field for an incorruptible crown that shall never perish? Think about that. Let's pray.